How about now? I hear it now. Well, good evening and welcome to our midweek Bible study and uh, time now that we want to kick off with you uh, just to say hello. Uh, we continue on, right? And uh, just continue to worship and honor the Lord in the circumstances that we're facing and in. And we will continue to honor His name as we uh, travel this path. I want to start out with uh, saying this Sunday is uh, very large for uh, many things. Uh, it also is uh, set aside for Memorial Day. But uh, as we will uh, worship in that time as well, and our, our service will gear toward a lot of our graduates that we will focus on, uh, in the beginning stages of our 10 a.m. service on Sunday. And uh, so we want to say uh, thank you, congratulations. Uh, we're proud of you uh, already and uh, continue to remember them as graduation is set uh, for tomorrow night. Uh, remember that. Uh, remember them in your prayers also. And I'm sure there'll be uh, some traveling afterwards. Uh, maybe, maybe not. But also... Uh, following a Sunday, this Sunday, we will have our time that's set aside where we will honor them. Uh, we're looking forward to that. We're going to have these first few pews uh, set aside for our graduates and their parents, their family. Uh, so you won't have to rush in, but we'll have those ready. That's a normal thing that we've done in the past. But uh, keep in mind uh, that following night, uh, that will be kind of their drive-through, walk-through, parade, reception. We've called it everything and thought of everything to try to uh, specify, but uh, they'll have that time across in our Family Life Center at 6 p.m. And uh, so remember that and continue to remember them in your prayers. So following that, I'd like to mention uh, a list of those that we continue to live to the Lord in prayer. And uh, let's start with... Daryl Montgomery's mom, continue to remember her. Uh, Danny and Linda Garrison, uh, they are continuing their process and their uh, uh, time of what they're facing of cancer. Uh, continue to remember them and their treatments as well. We think about those who are uh, in the nursing homes, the care facilities. Uh, those in name by would be uh, Lorene Thorne, Louise Raper, Ralph Purser, Coot Watts, Irene Williams, uh, Jeanette Stepp. So continue to remember those. Those are some uh, difficult times for them, uh, their families. So we continue to lift them to the Lord in prayer. Uh, Clayton Hampton, uh, see where he is doing uh, better. So we, uh, we urge uh, you continue to uh, lift him to the Lord in prayer as he continues to recover. Uh, also, Leslie Wright, we saw her out while we were out. Uh, doing some errands and then catching some lunch uh, today. So uh, looks like she was doing well uh, along with uh, riding around with her hubby. So remember uh, her as well. Nancy Lynch, uh, saw her a little bit yesterday. She was doing well, so continue to remember her. Uh, Jane Brazel, as she also uh, continues to recover from surgery as well. Uh, Johnny Jones, this is Lakeisha Holland's dad, uh, seems to be doing somewhat uh, better, so we continue to uh, lift him to the Lord as well. Uh, Britt, uh, Eric Armstrong's wife there, uh, up north if you will, uh, she's had some difficult days, seems to be doing better today, I know she's gotten back home, uh, so remember her in prayer as well, and also think about Annalise Rogers. She had an accident uh, yesterday evening, and uh, that was certainly God's hand was upon each and every person involved. Uh, talked with her this this evening, uh, and she said that she's a little sore. That's obvious, but uh, continue to remember uh, her as well. And I talked with Philip last night when I found out it was late, and uh, funny story, but yet quick uh, so he was involved in helping someone out and got the call that's a call that a parent never really wants to or ever wants to receive and uh, he said he found out that his truck would do a certain number 
And uh, it was pretty high. I won't give the number out. And uh, he was telling his dad as he got there. And uh, his dad asked him, well, well, son, why were you doing uh, that? And he said, well, uh, it wasn't do this speed. And that's why. And it was one number over that. So it was funny yet relieving for him, but yet thankful that everyone, including his daughter, was fine. I'm sure everyone out there that's viewing, listening, has unspoken prayer requests as well. Uh, also, um, these times, uh, often, every day, think about our president and his administration. I think they're doing a phenomenal job as we continue to lift them to the Lord. Health care workers, our state, local uh, officials, uh, the police departments, our mayor and city council. Thank them. Our colleges, high schools, all the things, the principals and teachers, we were able to see uh, several of those today when we went by to pick up our children's report cards. And uh, hooray, they passed, so moving on forward. And we're thankful for that as well. I'd like to uh, go to the Lord in prayer and remember these prayer requests and praise. And so at this time... Would you join me in a word and time of prayer? Lord Jesus, it is truly an honor to call on your name. And the name that is higher than all names, that I myself and my friends and family and others all across this world that know you as personal Savior and Lord can call upon your name. No matter where we are in these fine facilities or whether we're at home in our safe places, God, you're always there to hear. And I know personally on my behalf, I'm not always as consistent to hear like you always are, Lord. And that's why I'm grateful today that saying that we serve a perfect, all-knowing, all-caring God. And God, you've heard these names and by number and request and praise. And, and you've had everything under control. And we know and we trust you with that. But God, we want to continue to do our part in lifting them to you and saying, God, help in a time of need. Lord, in these times that we're living in and facing, we're not getting used to it by all means. And it's still difficult. But God, I believe with all my heart that you will and have been, will get full honor and praise out of this. So Father, again, it is truly a wonderful day to say and claim your name these things that we live to you and we pray in Jesus name. Amen. Jeremy.
Thank you for joining us as we have come together just to um, be an encouragement and uh, maybe a challenge to one another, as often is the case when we look into the, the word of the Lord. And I am so thankful for the day the Lord touched my heart and life. And if we were all gathered here this evening, as we were able to do Sunday morning, I would just pause and say, who would just stand and give the day? And the, the month and the year or the age or give us quick testimony. When did the Lord touch you? Uh, when did he make your life whole? And maybe just take a moment. And if you're there with family in your home this evening, uh, take a moment and just, just tell each other how old you were when you accepted Christ. Or tell them the month or the year when you accepted Christ. And, and if you're like me, uh, it's not just about... That day, for me, I was almost 14 years old. It was the summer of 1984, and um, I uh, was touched during that time. But then, there have been times since then, the Lord has continued to touch me. And He's continued to help me grow in my faith. And while I understood and I accepted salvation as a teenage boy... Uh, there are other just significant milestones, if you will, in my life where the Lord touched me and he challenged me and I grew closer to him and I grew uh, further in that decision to follow him. There's been times when I felt like I was walking right beside him and there's times when I felt like I was alone and those times alone were often my own making where I drifted away and I wasn't in this tight of a relationship, but then he touched me and he allowed me to come back closer into his presence yet again. And, and um, I hope you are experiencing the touch of the Lord in your life. Uh, with that in mind, how would you rate your passion for Christ? If you were to put it on a scale of one to 10 or one to a hundred, where would you fall in your estimation of yourself as you look in your life and you look at your walk with him? How at what level is your passion? And how does that show? How is that passion for him reflected? Uh, we obviously see his passion for us as he gave his all in Romans. Paul tells us he demonstrated his passion his love for us in that while we were yet sinners, he died for us. And so obviously he has a very high passion uh, for you and me. And he de demonstrated that by giving of his own life on our behalf. Where is that passion for us, uh, our passion for toward him? How would we rate that? Uh, a couple different passages of scripture I want us to look at this evening as we... Uh, our challenge from the word of the Lord. And I want to start in a very common parable, um, the parable of the soils. And then I want us to go into a couple other passages uh, coming out of the parable of the soils to describe this idea of passion and purpose in our life for Christ. Uh, the parable of the soils, we're going to be looking in Luke chapter 8. Luke chapter 8. 
uh, reading primarily verses 4 through 8, and then the interpretation of, that, of those passages a little later on in Luke 8. But it is recorded in Matthew 13 and Mark 4 as well. And so you might could read the context of all three of those accounts given in the, what's called the Synoptic Gospels and uh, kind of get a bigger picture of what's going on. But I want us just to go right into the meat of the parable, if you will, as Christ is sharing this parable uh, with those who are following him, who are, who are intrigued by his ministry as he's been touching people's lives. And then later, as he gives the interpretation to those who are closest to him, uh, his disciples, or we would call them his apostles. And so he says when in verse four, Luke chapter eight, verse four, it says, when much people were gathered together, these are all the people who are seeking. These are some people who are seeking truth. These are some people who are seeking healing. These are some people who are seeking to find fault in Christ. So it was just a multitude of people with all kinds of motives, all kinds of reasons for being there. And they were come to him out of every city. So he was drawing people because news of what he was doing, his popularity, popularity had grown. And they wanted to hear what this man Jesus had to say. And so they came out of every city where he was at. And it says, he spake by a parable. Verse 5, a sower went out to sow his seed. And as he sowed, some fell by the wayside. And it was trodden down, and the fowls of the air devoured it. And some fell upon a rock. And as soon as it was sprung up, it withered away, because it lacked moisture. And some fell among thorns, and the thorns sprang up with it, and choked it. And other fell on good ground and sprang up and bare fruit an hundredfold. And when he had said these things, he cried, He that has ears to hear, let him hear. And I read that last part of verse 8, and I'm automatically reminded of the thing that the things that Christ said to the churches in Revelation chapters 2 and 3 through the Apostle John. When he addressed the seven churches, he who has ears to hear, let him hear. And so there's a truth that he's trying to get across that not everyone will understand when they hear the parable. But those who uh, are his disciples, they should have an understanding. We're blessed because in this particular parable, Christ does give us the interpretation. But notice that there's four soils that are mentioned in the parable. Four soils. The first soil is hardened soil. And it's the hardened soil of the path where the, the people would walk through the garden area or walk through the fields. And uh, it, it's, a, it's, it's, a, it's a designed roadway, so to speak. It's not really meant for seeds or crops to grow in. And so the seed cannot penetrate the soil because it's so compacted. It's so hard. And it's quickly just snatched away by the birds as, as it's described in the parable. The second soil is described in verse 6, and it's the rocky soil. And the rocky soil uh, is a shallow layer of earth, or a shallow layer of dirt that's barely covering over um, the, the rocks that are below. I personally think where I live, my property is creating rocks. I think it makes rocks. It seems like every time I go to dig, and I think I've got all the rocks out, they, there again, there's another rock right there. Uh, this was, was rocky soil, and the, the seed falls on this soil, and it germinates, and it quickly grow, grows, possibly because that rock underneath actually helps absorb some of the sun's heat, radiate that, radiates that heat back, so it, it quickly grows. But because of the rocks, the plant does not have the depth of roots the structure it needs in order to sustain its life. Uh, it lacks depth. It lacks the ability to get enough moisture and nutrients, especially as the top layer of soil becomes dry. And so as quickly as it germinates, it terminates and that plant dies. The third soil is thorny soil. And it's a soil that's it's good ground as far as the, the quality of the dirt but the problem is the only seed that's there is not the seed that's been planted. There's weeds that are also 
falling into this soil and they germinate at the same time. And you not only have the crop that's desired come up, but you also have all the weeds that come up with it. And eventually the weeds become stronger than the initial crop and it crowds that desired plant out and it takes the life out away from that plant. The fourth soil is the best soil. It's the soil that uh, all farmers desire, and that's the fruitful soil. Uh, we, that's the, 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 the soil we hope to see as we plant our gardens this spring. And uh, in the summer, we hope to see that fruit being brought forth. And it's the soil that uh, allows that crop to grow. It allows that plant to be healthy. It allows that plant to produce. And at the end of all the time, we have a crop that is given. And so that's the, the explanation of the soils from strictly from the, uh, the gardening point of view, uh, the bot botanical explanations, I guess you will. But Christ is not teaching these people just to give them a lesson in gardening. Uh, that's not his intent. And so later the disciples in verse 9 asked him, what does this parable mean? What are you trying to teach us with this parable of the four soils? And so Christ takes time to help them understand a little better what he's trying to teach. And we see that in verses 11 through 15. It says, the parable is this. The seed that is planted is the word of God. And if you will, that is the gospel. The truth of what Christ is has done for us the truth of what God has orchestrated and what God has created not only in his creation but in his plan of salvation and so the seed is the truth of the word of God and that seed is planted in verse 12 it says those that are by the wayside or those that are in the hardened soil they are the ones that hear the truth. But the devil comes and takes the word out of their hearts, lest they should be saved. And basically those he explains that are of the hardened soil, um, the, the, the ones that are on that beaten down path that's in the parable, those are the ones whose hearts have never really been open to the gospel. who were, They do not respond positively toward Jesus Christ at all. Um, in Jesus' day, this would encompass the scribes and the Pharisees. Even though they knew so much about the Old Testament and God had given them so much of the Word and so much truth, when the living Word of God was standing right before them, they rejected Him. And so they would represent those who were on the hardened soil. They did not receive the gospel. The gospel made no impression upon them whatsoever. Satan snatches that seed before it can take root in their hearts. There's no response, no new birth, and no fruit. There are still people today who have hardened soil in their heart. They're non-responsive to the gospel and to the, the truth of God's word. The second uh, uh, soils described and we go on we see in verse 13 it says they that were on the rock or those that have the rocky soil or the shallow soil are they when they hear they receive the word with joy they're excited to hear the truth and these have no root which for a while believe and in time of temptation they fall away and so here you see a group of people who they hear the gospel, they hear the truth of God's word and they're excited and they they willingly receive that truth. And for a while, they're maybe on fire, maybe they're excited, but they never really develop any depth of understanding beyond just that salvation experience, maybe uh, that promise of heaven. Um, it may be that it's, they don't understand the entirety of what the gospel means when they accept it. They may have their own view still that they haven't let go of that is man-made instead of God's truth. They may be seeking a prosperity gospel, uh, which promises only 
good times and blessings and happiness and bliss. And we, we know there's many who preach that form of the gospel. Just enough of the truth for people to accept. They'll quote scripture, but they only quote the things that are good and that are blessings and that are exciting and that are joyful in that sense of, of uh, things are going the way I think they should go. And so it's a, a prosperity gospel. And so when temptation comes, when difficulty comes their way, when their faith is tried, they really haven't developed the depth that they need in order to sustain and in order to stand. And they fall away under temptation. Um, I, Christ's own words, uh, for a while they believe, but in the time of temptation... They fall away and they turn away from the truth of the word of God. That's the, the rocky soil. The third so soil is described in verse 14. And it says, they which fell among thorns, or the thorny soil, are they which when they have heard, go forth and are choked with cares and riches and pleasures of this life. And they bring no fruit to perfection. And so these are those who they understood the truth of God's word. They've accepted the truth of God's word and they've kind of just taken this truth and this new uh, belief. And they've kind of just added it into the portfolio of things that encompass their life. They have all these other things that they're doing in life. And it's like you have item A, which may be job, item B, which may be family, uh, item three, which may be uh, the things we enjoy doing, our passions, our pleasures, our desires. Item four may be goals, whether they be financial or whether they be social. And then you say, you know what, I've got this other truth out here and it's the truth of God. And that's item five. And I'm just going to stick it right in here with all these other things. And it's going to round me out as a person. And so I'll have all these different aspects of my life that I'm giving myself to. And I, I believe in the truth of the gospel, but I also have all these other areas of life. And it's almost like they're categorized and they don't necessarily bleed over. And especially the gospel bleeding over into them. And so what happens is, as Christ describes, these other concerns of life crowd out. The commitment to the truth of God's word. Notice how he describes it. He says all of a sudden they have cares uh, about riches. They have money concerns or money goals that overshadow the goals of the gospel. Um, they have cares or concerns about pleasures in this life. And they start desiring those pleasures more than they desire Christ. And what happens is these weeds grow up in their Christian life and it chokes the gospel out of their life. Um, one commentator that I had read says their concerns for money and for pleasure outgrow their first seeking the kingdom of God. And so their priorities become reversed. And it's not that the people represented by this thorny soil do not understand the costs of discipleship, but they are not willing to pay the price of discipleship. So for them, it's not a lack of knowledge, like maybe the uh, rocky soil that didn't have a complete understanding of everything, but it's a lack of dedication. It's a lack of commitment. And may I say, a lack of passion because the passions for other areas are stronger than the passions for Christ and his kingdom. The fourth soil is described in verse 15 and the first four soil says, but that which is on good ground, the good soil are they who in an honest and good heart have heard the word. They keep it and bring forth fruit with patience. And so you see, it, it's, it's very cut and dried. You have the good soil. They receive the gospel. They're excited about it. They receive it joyfully. Um, they, they, have, uh, they listen to it. They keep it. They, they hold on to it. They don't let go of the word of, of the Lord. And it's like it becomes a priority in their life. First and foremost. And, and instead of having categor categories like 
the, the thorny soil where God's just a, yet another thing in the list. What happens in the good soil is God is over all the rest. And they keep his word and everything else falls in line with what they have learned from his word. And they bring forth good fruit. Um, it represents those who have prepared themselves in the gospel. Their lives become uncluttered with competitive interests. Other values are, are put underneath the value of God and his kingdom. Um, it, it creates a plant, if you will, a believer who grows to maturity and bears fruit. And that's the ultimate goal. The ultimate goal is not just to be saved. I mean, that's important. And we desire that everyone accept Christ as their Savior. But we want to do more than just see people saved. We want to see people grow in Christ and produce fruit of Christ in their life. That's the ultimate goal of salvation. It's not just to say, okay, you're good now. Go do what you want to do. Live how you want to live because you've got your place reserved in heaven. You know, you've got your, you went on Ticketmaster and you, you put your money down, you paid for your spot. And so it'll be there waiting for you whenever you show up. That's not the goal. The goal is to grow and to produce fruit in your life for Christ. That's the purpose that we have been given as we live for the Lord. And so when we start thinking about purpose and passion in this context, Purpose is the goal. Purpose is the goal for which we're saved. And the purpose is to persevere, to grow, to reach maturity, to produce fruit for Christ. That's the purpose for which we're saved. We're saved not only to escape divine wrath, but to, and, and not only to live forever in heaven, and those are obviously two great things and two wonderful reasons to be saved because we do escape God's divine wrath and we are given the promise of eternity in heaven, but we're saved with the purpose of attaining a maturity and a fullness in Christ. Read Ephesians 4.13. We're also saved to bear fruit. Read John chapter 15. And specifically verse 5, to fall short of that maturity and to fall short of bearing fruit is to fail to attain the purpose for which we're called and set apart in salvation. So we have this purpose and the purpose sets our goals and our goals are lined out there before us and we tend to see purpose as just fulfilling obligations or fulfilling duty. But what drives us, what drives us to accomplish the purpose is what I want to close out our thoughts this evening. And we've already used the term and I've already asked you about it early on. But what drives us to accomplish the purpose is our passion. It's our passion. Louis Giglio defined passion as the fire that fuels our journey. So more than just a checklist of things that we want to, want to do, it's, it's a drive. It's a fire with inside. And passion is born out of what we value. And if we think about this, everyone values something. Just like everyone. I don't care who they are, whether they believe in God or say they don't believe in God. Everyone worships something. Everyone has that. that something that they're passionate about. And that they worship. And the things that we're passionate about and the things that we worship are the things that we value the most. Our passion is seen in what we are willing to do, what we are willing to pay, what we are willing to sacrifice for in order to achieve or to live out our values. We have these things that we hold in high regard. And we will arrange schedules, and we will devote ourselves entirely. We will pay money. We will give time. Why? Because we value that. And that's a demonstration of passion. Passion drives us to meet the purpose that we have set for ourselves or that we see that we need to fulfill. Um, 
our time, our affection, our energy, our thoughts, our money, our relationships, everything is given to what we value the most. Uh, I was reminded of this, and I guess it's what has, has sparked these thoughts in my heart and mind as I've been reading in the book of Acts. And we were in Acts chapter 2 Sunday, and, and Lord willing, a week from Sunday, we're going to be in Acts chapter 2 again, finishing up the second part of that, of, of that series, if you will. But I want to read to you what the Bible says about those early believers in Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2, verses 44 through 46, it says, All that believed were together, and they had all things in common. And sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all as every man had need. And they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with singleness, uh, with gladness and singleness of heart. And I'm going to go ahead, verse 47, praising God and having favor with all people. And so we see their passion. And I'm not saying that we need to go and sell everything we had and give it to the church to be redistributed to all the believers. But you see their passion for Christ reflected in how they live their life and what they chose to do. This is not necessarily a standard because later Ananias and Sapphira try to pass off in, in Acts chapter 5 as if they sold all their possession and gave everything. And it wasn't that they it wasn't the fact that they didn't give everything that got them in trouble. It was the fact that they lied about it and they were deceiving the church, trying to lie to God, saying they were giving everything when, in fact, they were holding some of it back. And Peter even said, was it not yours to do with as you pleased? So why lie to God? And so it's a reflection of passion. And they were passionate about this walk with Christ. Turn to Philippians chapter 3. Philippians chapter 3, um, verse 3, we see Paul's passion. And he gives a history of uh, the kind of man he was before he came to Christ. And believe me, Paul was passionate before he came to Christ. His conversion didn't create the passion, it just redirected the passion. And so he said that in verse 4, he goes... if. If any man thinks that he uh, could trust in the flesh, I have more reason to trust in the flesh. And then he gives this history, circumcised the eighth day of the stock of Israel, of the tribe of Benjamin, a Hebrew of the Hebrews, as touching the law, a Pharisee, concerning zeal, that's passion, concerning zeal, I was a persecutor of the church. He persecuted the Christians. Touching the righteousness which is in the law, blameless. And so here was a man whose religious fervor, his religious passion, his desire to follow after God as he understood God, which his view of God was warped at that time. He was passionate about it. And he said, there was no other person who had more passion than I did. And if, I could, if anyone could depend upon their own self-righteous accomplishments to get to heaven, to get into the presence of God, I would have been that guy. It was just purely based on the passion for trying to maintain the purity of what God had established. That's what Paul was desiring to do because he saw Christianity as a plague. He didn't understand. But notice in verse 7, he said, But what things were gained to me, those I counted loss for Christ. Once he came to realize that all of his righteousness and all of these things that he was trying to do for God in and of himself as a Pharisee, apart from Christ, he realized that they were empty, that they were, they were useless, that they would not accomplish the task of making him right before God. And he realized he needed to come to Christ. And he needed to have passion toward Christ. Instead of passion towards a false religion. Then he said all those things that were my accomplishments. In verse 8. I counted them as dung. Uh, manure. They were worthless. They were empty. Empty. And I put aside all my own self-righteousness and all my own personal accomplishments. And I put them aside that I may win Christ. 
and be found in him, not having my own righteousness based on the law, but that which is through the faith of Christ, the righteousness which is of God by faith. And so he describes that change of heart. And because of that change of heart, notice how his passion changed. Verse 13, he goes, I do not count myself to have apprehended, but this one thing I do, I forget those things which are behind, and I reach forth unto those things which are before. I press toward the mark for the prize of the high calling of God in Christ Jesus. We see a heart change, both in the people of Acts chapter 2, who, who were the formulation of the early church, and we see a heart change in the life of Paul, Saul, who becomes Paul the Apostle. What brought the change? They saw and they received Christ. That goes back to our parable. The Word of God made a difference in their life. And it changed the direction of their passions. I don't think they were any more passionate about Christ than they were about other things prior to meeting Christ. But when they heard the truth of God's word, and when they met the word of God in the flesh, it redirected those passions toward him. When we meet Christ, and we accept Christ, our way of thinking changes. Our attitudes and our outlook on life changes. We become more kingdom minded, more intentional about our walk with Christ, our witness, more intentional about our prayer life, more, have more of a desire to glorify God and a willingness to serve him every day, wherever we find ourselves. In 1 Corinthians chapter 9, and this is the last verse I want to share this evening as we as we think about this, but in 1 Corinthians chapter 9 uh, verse 24, Paul again is speaking. He goes, don't you know that everyone who runs in a race, they all run, but only one receives a prize. And he's talking about earthly competition here. And then he, he says, so you run that you may obtain. And he flips the switch from earthly competition to the spiritual race we're running in. Everyone who runs a race, they, they're passionate about the goal. And they do everything they can to make sure they're the first ones across the finish line. So that they could win that prize. That victor's prize. And then he says, so live your life for Christ in such a way that you will obtain that prize. In verse 25 he says, every man who strives for the mastery is self-controlled in all things. Now they do it to obtain a corruptible crown or a fading crown, a crown that will, no, will not exist for eternity. But what we are doing, we're doing for an incorruptible crown. For presence, to be in the presence of Christ for all eternity. He goes, I therefore run, not with uncertainty. And I don't fight as one who just beats the air uh, aimlessly. But I keep my body under subjection. I bring it under subjection, lest by any means, when I preach to others, I myself should be a castaway. And so Paul's challenge is keep the passion. Keep the passion to finish the race. We've started well. I remember that day I came to the altar. I remember that day I bowed before Christ and I received Him. And, and how exciting and how glorious and how wonderful that was. And how it changed the direction of my life for all eternity. But it's not just about how I start. It's also how I finish. And God did not save me and He did not save you just to start well. He saved us so that we would finish well. And that we would produce fruit all along the way. Passion, worship, living for Christ, however you want to describe that, is not about adding something else to our already busy schedules. Face it, all of us have busy days. We're very, we're, our days are full of things that we can do. 
And there's more and more people wanting us to add more and more things to just busy up the day. And so our walk with Christ is not about trying to see where can I make room in my day so I can have passion for God. Where can I make room in my day so I can live for Him? I've got all this going on. Oh, there's 10 minutes I can give God right there. I will be passionate for those 10. No, that's not what He's, he's asking for. And what he, he desires is that we allow God or we allow Christ to be in all the stuff. And that we allow Christ to even guide us in what stuff to be in. And as we fill our days, that we do so allowing Him to be the center of our days and all the stuff that we do. So we can still go and we can play summer ball or we can play fall ball or we can do these things. But what we do is we allow Christ to be in the center and we allow Him to bring glory. And we don't allow those things to crowd out our walk with Him. But our goal is to live for Him and for our relationship with Christ to grow stronger and to grow deeper and to be more vibrant every day so that He is exalted in everything we do. And I always think of this and I always go back and quote, whether you eat or drink or whatsoever you do, do all to the glory of God. And I find it interesting that the first two things that Paul mentions when he says that are the two things that we do at least two to three times a day. The common things. Whether you eat or whether you drink. And then he says, and all the other stuff you do, do all to the glory of God. And when we grasp that and we start doing that, then our passion is revealed as we allow God to be exalted through everything we do and produce fruit for his glory. I hope you're experiencing the joy of the Lord in your life. I hope you're passionate. And listen, I know emotions come and go. I know that we have moments where we're on a high and we're what we would call on fire. And the moments where we're on a low and we feel like we're alone. But let's continue to do everything we do. In season and out of season. For the glory of God. Exalting Him. That our passion for Him would not only carry us over the mountaintop but also will carry us through the valley when the temptations come. So we're reflective of that good soil and not that rocky or thorny soil that so many fall prey to. Let's bow together as we pray. Father, we love you and we thank you for your word. I pray that you would help us regardless of where we rated ourselves on how our passion is. Father, I pray that our desire would be to walk even closer to you. I pray that our desire would be. To even reflect you more. That you would use us individually as your believers. And collectively as your church. To make an impact on this world. For your glory. And father that doesn't take place. Just once a week on Sundays. That doesn't take place. Just every so often. Whenever there is a community outreach. Outreach event that's planned. Those are important. And we for sure want you to be glorified in those times. But Father, it has to take place as we live our lives for you each and every day. Give us wisdom. Help us to put you in charge of our schedules. And help us to allow you to be involved in every aspect of our schedules. That you would just continue to rise to the top of our lives. Wherever we find ourselves and whatever we find ourselves doing. We give you the praise. And we give you the honor. And we give you the glory. For all these things. And we ask it in Jesus name. Amen.